the dangers posed by nuclear weapons uh, and nuclear weapons buildups are still very much with us. There's um, a lot of work yet to be done. And to discuss some of the top challenges that uh, we face today uh, that will test the leadership of the next occupant of the White House, we have four excellent speakers uh, who are going to share their perspectives uh, on four uh, different but interrelated uh, nuclear weapons challenges. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Toby Dalton, who's the co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, where we're having our meeting. He's going to talk about the issues involving nuclear-armed rivals India and Pakistan, which continue to expand their own nuclear arsenals. Uh, we need to keep in mind that another cross-border attack involving these two states could trigger a nuclear conflict. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Zia Mian, who is the, who's with the Program on Science and Global Security at Princeton University. Uh, he's also co-deputy chair of the International Panel on Fissile Materials, um, which is a very important independent commission that looks at the challenges posed by weapons usable material, fissile material. Uh, he's also a member of our board of directors at the Arms Control Association. Uh, Zia is going to address the significant dangers posed by the growing accumulation of nuclear weapons usable uh, material and the security of those stockpiles, which is a challenge that continues even after the very important series of nuclear security summits uh, that were just concluded uh, earlier this year with the fourth here in Washington, D.C. And as we all know, uh, North Korea continues to pose an enormous nuclear nonproliferation challenge. Uh, Joel Witt, who's a former senior U.S. negotiator on North, North Korea, is now with the U.S. Korea Institute at SAIS uh, and the founder of the very uh, useful, important, and lively 38 North website, uh, is going to provide us with his perspectives on what uh, can and must be done uh, with respect to uh, curbing uh, the North Korean nuclear and missile threat in the months and years ahead. Last but not least, uh, we have with us uh, former Ambassador Susan Burke, who will share her perspectives on what must be done to maintain the health and credibility of the cornerstone of all nuclear nonproliferation efforts, the 1968 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Um, and we just heard in the previous section uh, session a uh, little discussion about uh, one of the more dynamic debates going on uh, surrounding the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, the open-ended working group on further measures to lead uh, to the elimination of nuclear weapons. You can read more about those developments uh, in the latest new section of the June issue of Arms Control today. Uh, Susan has decades of government experience on nuclear arms control and nonproliferation. Uh, she was special representative of the president for nuclear nonproliferation uh, from 2009 to 2012, uh, leading a successful effort at the 2010 uh, Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference uh, that produced a consensus action plan on nonproliferation and the dominant and crucial issue of nuclear arms control. So with those introductions, I'm going to turn it over to Toby Dalton. Uh, each of them is going to uh, speak for several minutes, and then we're going to take your questions for the panelists. So Toby, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Daryl. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. I didn't have to travel very far, about one floor down. Um, but as a longtime uh, admirer of the Arms Control Association, it's, uh, it's, it's great to have a chance to, to be with you today. Um, I should also say that um, I feel like what I'm going to say after the remarks that we heard a few minutes ago seems like a, a real abstraction. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting and important to think about these things in the abstract, but we can't divorce them from the reality um, that these are incredibly dangerous things and there are incredibly dangerous places and uh, we need to continue to, to, to think about and, and work on these issues so that nuclear weapons are not used again. I'll focus my remarks on what's happening in South Asia and what has happened in South Asia over the last 20 years and what that means for the next administration. Um, and it's remarkable that we've just passed now uh, the 18th anniversary of the 1998 nuclear tests by India and Pakistan. And um, I feel like it's gone incredibly quickly, and yet a lot has changed as you look at this issue sitting in Washington. You think about the priorities that we have had uh, since those tests. And first it was, you know, trying to make sure um, that the period immediately following the tests, uh, you had a, a conflict and crisis and 
uh, concerns about a, a war that could lead to nuclear escalation. Then we had the AQ Khan network and serial proliferation. Uh, and more recently, we've had uh, issues uh, of, of nuclear security and concerns about nuclear terrorism. Uh, in the meantime, the successive uh, governments uh, here have been, uh, successive administrations have been trying to mainstream India into the nonproliferation regime. Um, and still, we have these periodic crises between the two states, and it seems like uh, that issue uh, is, is the one that can always bring us back to, um, to, to real concern. Uh, and so I would argue that as we look at the arms competition that is, is shaping up in that region, uh, it argues for focusing our priorities a little bit more narrowly. I would say that as we look at the region, there are periodic observables of this competition. Um, but there are some major assumptions that we have to make and some very significant data limitations uh, as we try to assess what is happening there. Uh, oftentimes, there are sort of fact by assertion uh, in press releases that seem to be uh, what, uh, you know, how new capabilities are announced. Um, those don't necessarily constitute facts. So, um, oftentimes, those may be signal intent. Um, but they do give a flavor for how this security competition is evolving. I think you see now uh, growth in the numbers of nuclear weapons, certainly in the fissile material stockpiles, which I assume Zia will talk about in a little bit. You see a diversification of delivery vehicles uh, leading to changes in force posture, uh, perhaps even alert level, um, and then resulting command and control challenges that, that come with those. Uh, and we see that certainly in Pakistan uh, with the development now of short range, uh, so-called battlefield nuclear weapons. Um, and shifts in, in strategy to associate with those capabilities. Uh, you see it in India with longer range missiles and now potentially also the uh, development of MIRVs, uh, of putting nuclear weapons on submarines at sea. Um, China is a part of this region too, um, insofar as there is some evolving deterrent relationship uh, between China and India. Uh, unclear what that looks like. And then of course the U.S. is, is somehow uh, part of China's thinking uh, and the capabilities that we have been developing uh, over the last few years uh, are, are part of this picture. Um, how much of this is really a competition versus a series of parallel developments or even technological inertia? Uh, I think it's difficult to draw firm conclusions about that. I think in India and Pakistan you see some action and reaction that's happening. You have continued um, embrace or at least uh, tolerance of groups uh, in Pakistan. Um, that attack India periodically, which could be the flashpoint for a crisis. Uh, the most recent of these was an attack uh, in January on an Indian military base. Um, in that instance, there was cooperation between the two governments to try to untangle that. Um, that now has a, has a pattern that has been established over the last 15 years, if not longer. India has started to develop um, more uh, rapid, agile, uh, conventional military capabilities to try to punish Pakistan for continuing to tolerate these groups. That has allowed, or at least uh, provided some post hoc justification uh, for Pakistan to develop battlefield nuclear weapons to try to deter India from doing those things. Similarly, you've, you periodically hear from Pakistan uh, about the US-India nuclear deal and how that has been a driver of instability in the region. Um, in the India-China uh, axis, you have perhaps some spillover effects India developing a, a triad, it's ballistic missile develop, uh, ballistic missile defense plans. I mean, these are long standing and they don't seem to have an impact on China as yet, um, but that remains unclear. Uh, in the meantime, you also have active Chinese assistance uh, to Pakistan's nuclear energy program, nuclear energy program, um, but a history also of uh, assistance to Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. So what are the implications uh, of this? Uh, first, I think the security competition exacerbates the existing problems primarily in the India-Pakistan relationship. Uh, India has uh, a, a debate that is um, sometimes active, sometimes less so, about how it should evolve its nuclear thinking to address uh, this changing environment. Um, uh, focus uh, perhaps on shifting from massive retaliation uh, to punitive retaliation. Um, these are semantics, but they have important implications for how it thinks about using nuclear weapons. Pakistan seems to be moving towards a riskier posture, um, certainly from a security uh, and surety point of view, uh, that um, putting weapons out in the field 
uh, devolving them down the chain of command raises significant concerns uh, about nuclear security, as well as crisis instability and pressures uh, to use or lose on local commanders. Uh, the next administration will inherit the set of problems that previous administrations have not been able to appreciably dampen. Uh, and I think the primary challenges are going to continue to be nuclear security. I would argue for more of a focus on crisis escalation, uh, given that that is where uh, there is a significant chance of, of nuclear weapons being used. Uh, certainly, the Obama administration did a lot on nuclear security, uh, and on several occasions has praised the steps that Pakistan has taken in that regard. Uh, I think there are more questions and less focus than have, that have been given to India's nuclear security practices. Um, if you look at how the security competition might affect nuclear security, more uh, weapons, greater numbers of, of fissile material, um, more transportation of these things, uh, those exacerbate the weak links uh, in, in the security architecture. Crisis escalation is a very difficult problem to get in front of, and most of the U.S. effort uh, over the years has been reactive. Uh, again, technology, uh, added uh, materials, uh, capabilities, um, will make future crises likely to speed up, um, make it harder to intervene. Uh, and so I think that uh, is part of the reason why this issue deserves a higher uh, priority. But there's a tension between the, these two challenges, nuclear security and focusing on crisis escalation. Uh, the kind of cooperation and trust necessary for cooperation on nuclear security is significant. Uh, if you're constantly criticizing another country for their failings, or you're trying to coerce them into taking certain steps, they're less likely to give you uh, the kind of cooperation or open the facilities or um, you know, build the kinds of relationships uh, that would facilitate uh, better nuclear security practices. On the other hand, how do you uh, stop tendencies that have a, a natural momentum to them at this point uh, in terms of the, the buildup that we're seeing in these capabilities. It's hard to do that in a cooperative way. Uh, coercive measures seem to have a greater likelihood of success. Uh, and so figuring out how to resolve the tension between those two priorities is significant. That said, I have to say that our policy structure uh, has not really allowed the government, uh, the administrations, uh, and the Bush administration, the Obama administration, certainly, uh, to address the security competition, to resolve the prioritization problems uh, that come between our bilateral ambitions and our and sort of these regional requirements that, that follow these problems. Uh, this is a long-standing problem. So as I think about recommendations for the next administration, the first one that I would say, it's not sexy but necessary, is you have to fix the policy structure in a way that allows for thinking about this problem in a coherent way. It currently does not exist. You have a disaggregation of uh, the India and Pakistan and China responsibilities, the functional responsibilities. There's, there's no process that allows for uh, coherence to, to come to this, uh, this issue. Secondly, I think uh, as the strategic and economic dialogue is happening um, with China uh, this week, it's important to think about how China's interests in this region are evolving as well. Uh, what role does China see for itself now in South Asia? Uh, it has made a major investment uh, in Pakistan by announcing the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, $40 billion plus uh, of investment. Uh, that exposes China to risks uh, in ways that it has not been exposed to previously in South Asia. And with some interesting implications, it may be able to assert a more active role in the future in trying to dampen some of the crisis tendencies, or it may weigh more heavily in on the Pakistani side should there be another crisis. Uh, uncertain, uh, but important, I think, to, to try to press that issue uh, for our understanding with, with China. Third, I think it's important that there uh, is a willingness to be able to speak more openly about the, the areas where our interests uh, are different. Uh, and to back that up with both more sort of coercive gestures, but also cooperative measures. Uh, and that includes on nuclear security. And I think it's, uh, India has had a free pass on nuclear security for quite a long time. Uh, and I think it's time that that ends. Uh, fourth, uh, specifically on crisis escalation, there needs to be more of a focus on investing in fire breaks. Uh, I think if, with the sequence of events that have unfolded after the January uh, attack by uh, Pakistani-based militants uh, in India, you've seen uh, some sort of tentative steps to try to share intelligence 
uh, to cooperate in the investigation, uh, to try to build confidence. That is something that should be encouraged and to the extent possible facilitated uh, and institutionalized in ways that would allow that kind of process to hopefully stop a crisis or at least arrest the momentum. Um, lastly, an issue that's near and dear to my heart, um, there's been an assumption, it seems like, over the last 20 years that has taken hold uh, that somehow what's happening in India's nuclear program is more benign than what is happening in Pakistan's nuclear program. This is something of a taboo in DC, I think, uh, and it is manifest in the amount of news coverage that's given to every missile test that Pakistan undertakes. Um, and I think this is a little bit of a, a dangerous tendency. Um, it, it allows uh, this evolution to take place in ways that don't then uh, force us to think about the, the consequences. So we need to find other ways to encourage restraint in the region, not just by India, of course, but also by, by Pakistan. And one of the few points of leverage that we have left uh, is the interest of these states in signing up to the nuclear suppliers group. Uh, and that's uh, an issue that the Obama administration has pushed in terms of Indian membership, um, is uh, pushing this week with phone calls uh, to, to high-level uh, officials in other states. Um, but I think it, it would be better to try to build a consensus-based process on what the criteria should be for membership in the nuclear suppliers groups so that it raises the bar uh, and that we can use the interest of both India and Pakistan in becoming members in the NSG uh, to encourage restraint in their nuclear practices. So uh, with those five suggestions, uh, polite, I hope, uh, I'll pass it over. Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Toby. Uh, we'll turn uh, now to uh, Zia Mian. Um, thank you very much for being here, Zia. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I was asked to talk about um, the fissile material problem as part of the non-proliferation challenges for the next president. But as I'm sure all of you know, at least one of the candidates for president doesn't think that non-proliferation is actually a problem. And so it's hard to think about how to phrase the remarks in a way that captures a, a meaningful set of uh, propositions for whoever takes charge next. But let me start by making uh, one observation about one lesson we can learn from the last eight years, um, and perhaps uh, the last 16 years of non-proliferation policy in the United States. And that is that if the next president, whoever it is, is going to be serious about at least the fissile material part, the nuclear weapons material, uh, challenge in terms of non-proliferation, we have to get past what has been non-proliferation theater. And by this, I mean these um, somewhat grandiose statements that have characterized both the Bush administration and the Obama administration when they come to talk about fissile materials. And the most obvious element of this was the suggestion that goes back to the Bush administration of what they said was the goal of securing all vulnerable nuclear material within four years. And many, many years have passed. An enormous amount of political attention has gone into this, and especially under the Obama administration with the nuclear summits that we've seen, the most recent being in Washington. And one has to be candid that in terms of the actual fissile material problem in the world, we are talking not even about the tip of the iceberg. We are talking about the snowflake that sits on top of the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, to think that, you know, starting in 2010, we have 50 plus world leaders gathering every two years to talk about this with great import and fanfare and lots of PR. And all that has come out of it in actual material terms, not the PR terms and the promises to, to, to do better, but in actual material terms, dealing with the materials that they said was such a profound threat. President Obama told us what has been achieved. He said that in the six years of the nuclear security summits between 2010 and 2016, he says, and I quote, we've now removed or secured all the highly enriched uranium and plutonium from more than 50 facilities in 30 countries, more than 3.8 tons. 
which is more than enough to create 150 nuclear weapons. Wow. By the best estimate, including the one that the president mentioned later in his speech, this is 0.2% of the pistol material in the world. Six years, four summits, 50 presidents and prime ministers, and we have addressed 0.2% of the problem. And that's only if you look at what's been, as they say, secured or eliminated. The countries that were still producing fissile material for nuclear weapons in 2010 are still doing it. That's Israel, Pakistan, India, and North Korea. All the other nuclear weapon states had stopped long before this process. So we've secured 0.2%. But we haven't actually stopped anybody from making more, and they've continued to do it. The second thing that comes from that is that the overwhelming policy choices that have been made, especially by the United States, have actually pushed things in exactly the opposite direction. It's been about securing mostly material in civilian facilities, in non-weapon states, which was already under safeguards. In other words, it's the stuff that was the most accounted for and the most monitored already. The stuff that should have been the focus of any effort to actually address the fissile material problem is the large share of fissile material that is actually held by nuclear weapon states and is unaccounted for and undeclared largest holders of fissile materials in the world are the United States and Russia. These are legacy stockpiles of the Cold War. And there has been an amazing reluctance to begin to address this problem throughout the last administration or the one before. So the first thing for the next president, whoever it is, if they're serious about fissile materials, is to actually decide that never mind chasing small amounts of you know, kilogram quantities of fissile material that by themselves couldn't even be used to make a nuclear weapon, but to actually deal with the ton quantities and the hundreds of ton quantities that actually are directly under US control or under the control of its direct close allies. Then we can worry about other people's materials. So let me give you two things that follow from this. The first is that the United States now has enough fissile material set aside for weapons that is twice as large as the total amount needed for all the operational warheads the United States actually has. 4,000 plus operational warheads. The United States has fissile material set aside for 10,000 weapons. That's not including the stuff that is already declared excess and everything else. So the first question is, why is there such a large overhang of fissile material which is not going to be used in weapons unless somebody has a plan somewhere to double the size of the arsenal one? Now, in the past, the United States has declared fissile material excess to its weapons and military needs. That was a long time ago. The last time the United States declared highly enriched uranium excess was in 2005. At that time, the United States had 8,000 operational warheads. Now it has 4,000, give or take. And yet it still has all of that HEU that it had back in 2005. So the first thing is, why not reduce the stockpile of HEU set aside for weapons to reflect the reduction at least in the operational nuclear stockpile. Associated with that is the fact that when the United States did declare fissile material excess, the highly enriched uranium, it said, okay, we're gonna dilute this stuff, down blend it and turn it into fuel for nuclear power plants. It has been down blending at the rate of a couple of tons per year. There is 40 tons left according to the Department of Energy, until 2030 to finish down-blending the stuff. The Russians were down-blending at a rate 10 times that of the Soviet Union, of, of the United States, when they were down-blending their highly enriched uranium. 
know, why can't the United States just hurry up and finish down blending the stuff that's already there rather than deciding it's going to take him another 15 years to down blend this remaining 40 tons? And it's a question of priorities. The priority is one kilogram of highly enriched uranium in Jamaica, not the 40 tons that's just sitting there and could be down blended basically inside a year. So in material terms, when you follow the material and account for the material and take mm -hmm. responsibility for the material, the focus really has been in the wrong place. And perhaps nowhere more so than with plutonium. Everybody in this room is familiar with, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be hilarious, the MOX plant. The multi-billion dollar plant that now is never going to be built, but has consumed enormous amounts of political effort and energy, has been the subject of countless studies to dispose of 34 tons of plutonium that was declared excess for weapons purposes in 2007. We were supposed to have really got to grips with this plutonium problem. And yet now it looks like the MOX plant will never go anywhere. And the Russians are about to begin getting rid of their share of their 34 tons. And there's no immediate process to begin with the United States dealing with its 34 tons of plutonium. So if we're going to deal with this 34 tons of plutonium that was declared excess, the question is, Either we wait for this interminal process to continue of MOX plant or this new strategy of dilute and dispose whenever it begins, or we can think about what can you do concretely now to show good faith in actually moving this process forward. And there have been concrete suggestions how to deal with this, and it would be good to see the next administration actually prioritize urgency as a metric. That it's not enough to just say that we're going to do this someday, one day, but to say this is actually the highest priority that we have in dealing with fissile materials is dispose of them as quickly as possible and see how that changes the calculus. And the easiest thing that could be done, and it's there for those of you who are interested in the Red Team report on plutonium disposition that came out in 2015. And they said, look, you know, we can either that MOX making the plutonium into fuel for nuclear power plants is going to be too expensive and take too long, so let's stop. What we can do is this strategy of diluting and disposing of it in a, in a repository, but the red team actually had an interesting suggestion that hasn't received the attention it deserves, and that was that they said there's an even faster way of dealing with this problem, and that is to sterilize the pits. In other words, to render them unusable again in a weapon, and that this could be done in situ at the Pantex nuclear facility and then prepare them for disposal. But what you've done is irreversibly made them safer. And so one could very quickly and very cheaply begin to show that this plutonium will never go back into weapons in a very quick and speedy way. So if you think about it in those kinds of steps, if the United States was willing to show that it took dealing with its own fissile material legacies more seriously, there might be greater prospects of making progress at the Geneva at the talks on a fissile material cutoff treaty and of dealing with the fissile material stockpiles held by other countries because the largest problem in terms of fissile materials is not the small stockpiles held by Pakistan and India and North Korea and Israel or even China. Real stockpile problems that we face in the world are, as I mentioned, the giant stockpiles from the Cold War held by the United States and Russia, and then the vast <coughs> stockpiles of civilian plutonium that have been accumulated by Britain and France and Japan. Japan has 10 tons of plutonium in Japan. Right? It has much more held in Britain and in France. 10 tons of plutonium is larger than the plutonium stockpile held by some weapon states. If you just decide that we're going to go after the largest stockpiles, regardless of where they are, then one begins to have a different geography of what the problem is and where attention needs to go. And the question is that how do we then work with Britain and France and Japan, who are all very close US allies, to say, given that between us we have several hundred tons of plutonium, 
what are we going to do to get rid of this stuff and make sure that it is disposed of as quickly as possible. The proliferation scenario looks very different. And so I think that the next administration is going to take a fissile materials perspective to thinking about this rather than the old school non-proliferation perspective where, you know, it's countries that we don't like that are a problem, right? Regardless of the fact that they may have materials that are so small as to be insignificant in terms of what we actually have to deal with. Just to give you one perspective and then I'll stop. When the United States declared its stockpile of highly enriched uranium and plutonium, that this is how much we made and this is how much we have left, there was material that they couldn't account for. <clears throat> it's not lost. They just don't know exactly where it went or if they even made it in the first place because nobody was responsible for keeping accurate accounts always from the beginning. But so there's about three tons of plutonium that the United States is, you know, it's, it's unclear where it is. And in terms of nuclear weapons tests, also there are several tons of material that was used up in the nuclear weapons tests, and you can't exactly always account for it in your reporting. Now, these multiple ton quantities that the United States can't account for pales in comparison to what the Russians can't account for. And yet, no one has taken seriously this question of going to the Russians and saying, why don't we try and account for our materials together? Right? You help us figure out where our stuff went, and we'll help you figure out where your stuff went. And at the end of it, you know, it doesn't necessarily expose any national security secrets, but at least we'll start to get a better understanding of the mess we made of the world for the last 70 years in terms of polluting it with making highly rich uranium and plutonium. But these amounts that are unclear, material that is unaccounted for, is larger than the stockpiles held by Pakistan and India and North Korea and Israel, significantly so in most cases. So you have to ask the question that, you know, if you move away from worrying about countries that you don't like to actually dealing with the materials which are the real problem, especially if you worry about material falling into the wrong hands, then follow the material, and then the politics will follow. Thank you, Zia. And there's a course that he teaches at Princeton University about these issues and more. Um, next, uh, we're going to have uh, Joel Witt talk to us about uh, one country that has, has gotten the attention of uh, our two leading presidential candidates, North Korea. Joel, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Daryl, <laughs> thanks for inviting me here today. I, I I have a long association with the Arms Control Association, and I came to Washington. I guess it was in 1980. Bill Kincaid and Pete Scoville were really very helpful for me, so it's a, a great honor to be here to, to talk to you today. Um, given the limited amount of time I have, I'm going to make three points. First. North Korea's nuclear and missile programs aren't fake. Well, you're all looking at me like, duh. But in fact, up until recently, there have been a number of experts and a number of other people who think that the danger has been grossly exaggerated. And there have been some people who claim that it's just an elaborate ruse by the North Koreans to get our attention. I think that idea is not true. It wasn't true before. It's not true now. And in fact, also, it was part of U.S. and South Korean policy to downplay the threat. That was part of the policy of strategic patience. And it was based on the idea we didn't want to feed the North Koreans craving for attention. And therefore, we wouldn't make much of what they were doing. And the last problem, of course, has been the media issue, the media attention. Uh, I read the media every day, and I'm sure most of you don't, on North Korea. And a lot of it focuses on Kim Jong-un's hairstyle and whether he's really overweight or all of these really important issues. But in fact, how many of you know that as we are sitting here today, North Korea has probably started another campaign to produce more plutonium at its Yanbyon nuclear site. The signs are obvious. All you need to do is look at the commercial satellite photography. 
Of course, I'm not saying that we should jump to the other extreme. We need to avoid worst case analysis. But given what's been going on, particularly in the last six months when it's been very vis visible, at least we've put to rest the idea that this is just some news. Last year, uh, our institute did a year long study on North Korea's nuclear future. Uh, we came up with three different projections going to 2020. And I should mention that uh, people like David Albright and a number of missile experts worked on these projections. The findings basically were that from North Korea's current nuclear stockpile of about 10 to 16 weapons, uh, it may grow by 2020 to 20 weapons, which is, of course, the worst case for the North Koreans, or 100 weapons, which is the worst case for us. And on its current trajectory, maybe about 50 weapons. And there will also be qualitative improvements, and that depends, of course, on the type of nuclear testing. On the missile front, you see the same sort of forward movement, although, as we all know, it's much more difficult to build uh, effective long range missiles. We have three scenarios there, and in the worst case for us, they're moving down the road to the um, which we've seen in parades and we've seen tests of its rocket motors. But just putting that aside, I think the one thing we all need to keep in mind is that even if North Korea never conducted another nuclear test or never conducted another missile test, it can continue to produce nuclear weapons. That's not a problem. It has the facilities to do that. And it already has hundreds of missiles. So this is a problem for the region. These missiles can't reach the United States. But it's certainly a problem for South Korea and Japan and even China. So the bottom line here, this is a serious program. It's been steadily advancing for the past eight years. Um, the issue for all of us is how far will it advance. And quite frankly, it seems to me that the North Koreans don't have much incentive to stop. Second, what are the implications if these current developments continue unabated? There is, of course, a litany of dangers, which I think most of you are familiar with, but I'll just repeat them here. First, there's not only the growing danger to our allies and our troops in Northeast Asia, but also to the United States itself if North Korea moves forward with building an ICBM. And there's every indication that's their intention. Second, there's the danger to our ability to maintain strong alliances in Northeast Asia. That's the bedrock of the administration's pivot to Asia. And that bedrock depends on extended deterrence and the credibility of our security guarantee quite likely will be undermined as the North Korean threat grows. <clears throat> Linked to that, of course, is the danger that South Korea and Japan will feel they have no choice but to build their own nuclear weapons. They know all the laundry list of arguments about why that will never happen, but we can't be sure, and particularly we can't be sure Day and what it may do in the future. And speaking of presidential candidates, now we have the Trump factor. And maybe it would be a good thing if South Korea and Japan built their nuclear weapons. There's the danger of a growing threat to stability in the region, and particularly crisis stability. And I guess there's some parallels here between South Asia and Northeast Asia. As we all know, the Korean Peninsula is not a very stable place in the best of times. There have been periodic armed clashes, and it's quite possible they'll continue into the future. And on top of that, while, once again, not a lot of attention has been paid to it, there's already an arms race on the peninsula. Yes, we all know about what North Korea is doing, but do we all know about what South Korea is doing in terms cruise missile programs, and also its focus on preventive and preventive, preemptive use of those weapons. Japan may follow as well.
And finally, there's the danger, once again, we all know that North Korea will export nuclear and missile technology. They've said a number of times they'll be a responsible nuclear weapons state, but you know, I'm not sure how much that's worth. It's not worth much of anything, particularly if the sanctions continue to grow an impact on North Korea and they're forced to find hard currency in other places. Third point, I've been asked to lay out what policy options are available to the next president to mitigate this threat. Well, quite frankly, as someone who's worked on this issue for over 20 years now, I would say our options have narrowed significantly in the past eight years as this program has grown and grown in dimension. It's clear to me from talking to North Koreans, I meet them regularly in track two meetings. These are senior North Korean officials. It's clear to me that in talking to them since at least 2012, they've got a bounce in their step. They've been building these weapons. No one's been able to stop them impose sanctions on them. They've done very well, even with the limited sanctions we've imposed on them. And so if I was a North Korean, I'd be feeling pretty confident. Having said all that, let me just lay out five very quick suggestions for guidelines for the next administration's policy. First, make dealing with this challenge a priority. This may sound strange, but it hasn't been a priority. It's not a priority, even though we've talked about rebalancing to Asia, the importance of our alliances, nuclear security. And I know there are many meetings between US and Chinese officials, senior level meetings where North Korea barely comes up. So if it doesn't come up in those meetings, it's not a priority. Second point, Stop the magical thinking about how to deal with North Korea. It's amazing that I still maintain my sanity, quite frankly, because I hear all sorts of ideas about how we should deal with North Korea. And there isn't enough time in this meeting to talk about all of them, so I'm not going to do that. But there are a lot of ideas floating around out there, from the administration's policy of strategic patience to the idea of Korea, of regime change and Korean reunification. In my mind, they all qualify as magical thinking. They are unrealistic. Third, a related recommendation, think strategically, not tactically. We are constantly reacting to what North Korea does. And when they don't do anything, we don't do anything. So what we need to do is to return to basics. What are our objectives here? How do we achieve them? What tools should we use? This may all sound very strange, but we aren't doing this basic calculation. Fourth, be willing to think out of the box. You know, everyone is so quick to dismiss any North Korean proposal that we're never going to get this process going if we are indeed interested in trying to have negotiations with North Korea. Uh, once again, I don't have time to relate all those, but I'll be happy to, to talk about them. Fifth, we need to be willing, whoever the president is, should be willing to take the domestic political risks to secure our national interests, as long as there are no security downside. Once again, that may, make, that may have some resonance, but the fact is that we haven't been willing to take those domestic political risks. So maybe the fact that Donald Trump has now said he would meet with Kim Jong-un I'm not sure if that'll give uh, any domestic political coverage, but at least it's a, a, a new wrinkle in that, in that area. So as far as I'm concerned, domestic political risks are the only downside to an approach that combines diplomacy with strong. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. We're glad you, uh, you've maintained your sanity to this point. It's a very, very sobering uh, presentation. Um, 
Next, um, former Ambassador Susan Burke is going to talk about the broader set of challenges that uh, face the next U.S. president relating to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as a whole, uh, where these issues and others are discussed uh, every uh, five years in a cycle and, and in between. And so thank you very much for being here, Susan. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I wanted to thank the Arms Control Association for all work that they're doing to advocate for and, and advance a responsible arms control and non-proliferation agenda. From what we've heard so far this meeting, uh, this um, this morning, um, I, I feel like I should say my name is Susan and I'm a non-proliferator. Uh, this has a quality of a support group and I appreciate the Arms Control Association for providing those of us who suffer from this affliction being a, having an opportunity to be with other true believers and kind of share share our burdens. Um, this morning, I wanted to focus on the disarmament pillar where the divide between the haves and the have-nots within the NPT is the greatest. I was asked to address the impact of these challenges on the health of the treaty, and so I'll talk a bit about the impact of the divide and some options to address this divide. Um, and I've really tried not to be political, um, but I may not be able to help myself. Um, in any case, uh, you know, over the years, the parties to the NPT generally have agreed uh, fairly consistency, consistently on the important, even central role that the treaty has played in grounding and upholding the global nonproliferation regime. And at the same time, frustration over the pace and the process of nuclear disarmament and increasingly disagreement over the role of nuclear weapons in NPT nuclear weapon states national security strategies and our first speaker talked about deterrence has been a feature of NPT review conferences. We're hearing that more and more. Um, I was involved in the 2010 review conference and, and that benefited uh, tremendously from the goodwill that had been generated by the nuclear agenda laid out by President Obama in Prague. Um, and it was also uh, helped by a substantive decision on the Middle East, which paved the way for consensus agreement on the action plan that Daryl mentioned in his opening remark. Um, there were a number of pieces of that action plan, and, and two things in particular I'd mention. One was that action plan launched uh, an unprecedented process of P5 engagement, and uh, no laughing, and provided for increased accountability through reporting by all states, and those were two important uh, developments. But perhaps expectations were unrealistically high on all sides. We certainly thought that was possible. Or this modest progress was seen as an opening for more ambitious sweeping proposals, sort of opening of the floodgates. Because uh, as soon as the NPT parties reconvened in 2012 to begin to prepare for 2015, what has become known as the Humanitarian Consequences Movement began to emerge. And the first of three international conferences on the subject was rolled out. Now, um, the nuclear, the NPT nuclear weapon states declined to participate in the first two meetings. Uh, the U.S. and the U.K. participated in the third. And by doing so, uh, in my view, they forfeited the opportunity to contribute to the developing narrative. And they strengthened the hand of the groups who were seeking to move outside of the NPT framework to achieve disarmament. Now, as support for this movement was growing, the prospect of further U.S.-Russian arms reduction negotiations was fading. Russian nuclear saber rattling was increasing. North Korea, as Joel has mentioned, was continuing to conduct nuclear explosive tests and engage in provocative behavior, and the Conference on Disarmament remained paralyzed. And against this backdrop, the 2015 NPT Review Conference last year again made a run at a consensus final document, but stumbled in the final hours over the Middle East issue. There's no direct evidence that consensus would have been broken over the disarmament text of that report alone, and I did my best to try to get people to tell me if that was the case. But the lack of enthusiasm for the disarmament text has been widely reported, and, and so, and I've even heard from some that there was relief in some quarters among non-aligned states and others that there was no document, uh, because they were not uh, particularly pleased with the disarmament text. Um, but that, that draft, which was not finalized, did include some initiatives uh, that, including the UN open-ended working group that Daryl mentioned, um, as well as calls, again, for regular detailed reporting, and it's the whole, the whole rubric of accountability. And the, the open-ended working group, which I'll talk about a bit, was something that the nuclear weapon states, the NPT weapon states, appeared to be prepared in the document. 
Um, I know that the U.S. was prepared to support it. So notwithstanding the fact there was no agreement on a document, there, uh, soon after the review conference, the U.S. signaled its willingness to engage in the OEWG on the basis of the terms agreed by the NPT parties, and that is that decisions would be taken by consensus. As we said at the beginning, these are my personal reviews. Uh, views I represent only myself. I don't represent anybody. Um, I think that the decision to establish the OEG uh, ultimately under different terms than had been agreed at the review conference, and that was to go to UN rules, which would be removed from voting, uh, made for a missed opportunity. Uh, you had a proposal that the NPT nuclear weapon states were prepared to sign on to and engage in as long as it was consensus and at least would have got a process going of discussion in this OEWG with the weapons uh, possessors. And so those who pushed for a vote, I think, um, I question their motives. And I have heard from some who attended the OEWG, no one in this room, I'll have to say, who were told by some states that they actually didn't want the weapon states to participate, and that was one of the motivations. And if that's the case, I think there's a problem here, and it may not be the usual suspects. Um, engagement is a two-way street, and it requires reflex flexibility on both sides. And so if one side is, is setting up a, a situation that they know the other side's not going to be able to live with, I, I think we need to look at the cold hard light uh, on, on their motivations. Um, in any case, since a fourth humanitarian conference has not been scheduled for various reasons, the CD continues to be stuck. Um, the OEWG has become the focal point for debate on disarmament, but without the input of the NPT nuclear weapon states, or any other weapons possessors for that matter, because no states possessing nuclear weapons attended the meeting, according to Kingston's article in the Arm but the OEWG, again, without any weapons possessors, is also discussing the so-called legal gap in the NPT, which has become an issue uh, in the NPT context. And this is what some states argue is the lack of a clear definition of the effective measures <laughs> they eat this um, to, to be negotiated relating to nuclear disarmament, the effective measures uh, mentioned in Article 6 of the NPT. And there's no consensus on the matter of whether or not there is or is not a legal gap. And I would uh, recommend Canada's very well-argued rebuttal of the, the notion of a legal gap in a working paper they tabled in the OEWG. I think it's working paper 20, Rev 1. And it's a good legal analysis that suggests there is not a legal gap and that the treaty itself is sufficient uh, to do whatever you need to do. Um, now, the, the OEWG has gotten some press because several states tabled a proposal, as a handful of states, to convene a conference next year to begin negotiating an agreement to prohibit nuclear weapons. But there are a number of other papers that have been tabled that lay out the, the, um, the proposals that we all co come to know and, and understand. Um, uh, building blocks, which is step by step, a, a, a convention, a nuclear weapons convention, a ban treaty, or a framework agreement. And these are all proposals that have been tabled in the NPT review context. Um, I would say for many of the participants in these meetings, regional and global insecurity is very real. They believe their concerns are legitimate and their frustration with the nuclear weapon states and the NPT process had led them to this venue. Now, I'd also say the U.S. has aligned itself through the Prague speech and the 2010 nuclear posture review with the concerns expressed about the humanitarian impact of nuclear use, and they've connected to the goal of the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. So these are discussions that have a direct bearing on the future of the NPT, and I believe the United States and the other NPT nuclear weapon states should be involved. Now the challenges facing the NPT regime are real in the sense that frustration over the pace of nuclear disarmament and fear of nuclear use has contributed to the growth of this humanitarian consequences movement, and it's led some extremely well-informed and well-placed observers to conclude that the two sides, the have and the have nots, are more polarized than they have ever been, which is, which is pretty alarming. Now, this movement provides an opportunity not only for states to show concern about and dissatisfaction with the status quo, but to take matters in their own hands outside of the NPT and without the nuclear weapon states if necessary. And this is not going to strengthen that treaty. It will, and it will not fill the void that many believe has emerged in the absence of further progress on the Prague Agenda. Now, bridging the divide is going to require that we make common cause with our partners to address the concerns that fuel the humanitarian consequences movement. 
Now, I was asked to provide a best case and a worst case, and I won't get into the issue of uh, politics, but we, you know, it, who gets elected in November, I think will very much influence the best, whether or not there's a, the best you can make or the worst you could imagine case. Um, because the 2020 NPT Review Conference is the 50th anniversary of the NPT's entry into force. And, and shortly after 2015, uh, folks already began to look ahead to that as a dramatic milestone moment and a, a very symbolic uh, conference. So no matter what happens, I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be something to watch. And even under the best circumstances, there's going to be a challenges. So how do you mitigate that challenge? How do you make the best of, of that situation. Well, I think the next U.S. president early on has to reaffirm strong and unequivocal support for the international nuclear nonproliferation <clears throat> regime, including the NPT in all aspects, disarmament, nonproliferation, no spread of nuclear weapons to any countries, and peaceful uses. And I think that has to be very clear. And I, a, a Prague-like speech that reflected continuity uh, in the nuclear agenda, I think would do a lot to reassure international partners uh, about continued U.S. leadership, partnership, and shared objectives. And I know there's a lot of criticism about the Prague agenda not being fully realized, but I think it's a heck of a good place to start and something like that that builds and moves forward. Um, such an agenda could also include commitments to sustain the work of the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification. I would suggest seeking to expand its membership to include more key non-aligned partners, uh, explore involving other non-governmental organizations able to make technical contributions, and to make the partnerships work as transparent as possible. Um, these efforts are a way to use the time available now in the current disarmament lull, if you will, to prepare for advances later when the process resumes and to improve uh, understanding and education of a wide variety of states on the verification challenges of lower and lower nuclear uh, numbers. Um, the next president should uh, announce pr preparation to negotiate a five-year extension of New START to be in place before that agreement expires in 2021. Um, and this would be a way to re-engage Russia on non-proliferation arms control issues, and I do not in any way underestimate the difficulty of doing that. Uh, they should, uh, she or he should persevere with the P5 process and be a leader in promoting P5 transparency and accountability for the benefit of the MPT. Now, at last year's ACA annual meeting, <clears throat> Lewis Dunn outlined several possible P5 initiatives to be pursued through this process, including P5 actions to minimize the risk of nuclear weapon use by anyone, as well as a P5 code of nuclear conduct. And I would urge people to take another look at those ideas. And if I were advising the next president, I would uh, urge, urge that. I think pressure should be kept on getting FMCT negotiations in, in, uh, going in Geneva. I understand that this may be a fool's errand, but it is import, important for, um, for a number of reasons. And if the U.S. has flexibility on stocks, as been reported, that would be an important development. Um, the next president should uphold the 24-plus uh, year nuclear testing moratorium and should recommit to get the CTBT ratified. And I would suggest ways to uh, signal um, continued support for the CTBTO and the international monitoring system and a way to make sure that that system is, is uh, made a, a permanent part of the international nonproliferation architecture. Um, the ratification is a tough issue, as we all know, and it kind of depends what happens in other races. But I, I think more effort should be made to make the case to the American people and to Congress on why the CTBT is good for the United States. And I think this is something that both the U.S. government and NGOs can do uh, more on here. And I know ACA is doing a tremendous amount of work. But don't underestimate the importance of getting out the word to, uh, to the American public. And then I would say re reaffirm the U.S. negative security assurance contained in the 2010 Posture Review um, and recommit to pursue ratification of the uh, free zone protocols and to get the other free zones uh, protocol is completed. And then in a very heretical uh, step, I would suggest that uh, the next president signal willingness in an appropriate venue to discuss the conditions under which a global uh, negative security assurance agreement could be pursued. Under, under what conditions? What would be the, the, the regional security conditions? I know that's, I'm a heretic, but let it be. 
Um, and then finally, uh, we should not shy away from joining the ongoing multilateral discussions on disarmament. Um, uh, if we believe that our position is a sound one, we should, we should be prepared to engage with partners and defend our position. Um, maybe they'll learn something, maybe we'll learn something. But I think this would signal a clear commitment to engage with partners of all types, both those with weapons and without, and to work with and through multilateral institutions, which, you know, better for worse, or where the work's going to get done. And this should be part of the new president's agenda. And while, while this would not discourage certain states from pursuing solutions outside of the NPT um, to force disarmament progress, this posture is going to strengthen the hand of U.S. allies and friends whose positions are closely aligned with ours. And so, you know, we need to, you know, you can't fight something with nothing, and this is a way to, uh, to get a real discussion going. Now, even under such a scenario, a successful NPT review in 2020 is a 50-50 proposition, and that's probably generous, since nuclear disarmament is not the only issue that can derail agreement. But if the goal is to reinforce the centrality, the indispensability, and the irreplaceability of the NPT, uh, then strong, responsible, and creative U.S. leadership and engagement and demonstrated, and I would say, respectful sensitivity to the very real concerns of a large number of non-nuclear weapon states will be essential. Now, I'm not even going to talk about the worst case because I'm already depressed from what I've heard so far, but I'll be happy to talk over coffee or answer questions. But I would just say, in, in conclusion, um, a proactive and positive U.S. non-proliferation and arms control agenda is essential for a best case outcome, and I use best case. Um, but it's not a guarantee of such. And as I've noted, bridging the divide is a two-way street, and the non-weapon states and even the NGOs must be willing to engage in the search for common ground. Uh, I would also note on arms control, it takes two to tango, and right now I would say this government doesn't have a partner, so it should not be held uh, at, to be blamed for not moving forward without without a partner, but maybe work can be done to try to encourage the partner to get engaged. The humanitarian consequences movement has provided a vehicle for non-nuclear weapon states to articulate their concerns and their fears about nuclear weapons, which are legitimate, I think we, we've heard today, and to vent their frustrations with programs and policies they believe, rightly or wrongly, put them at greater risk. The challenges facing the NPT regime will require steady, informed United States leadership that builds on the decades of work that's already been, been done to reduce nuclear dangers. Thank you. Uh, as I said this morning at the outset of the meeting, uh, we have a very substantive uh, and high-level uh, program, and uh, I appreciate all the uh, the ideas uh, and the problems and some of the solutions put in the table by our, our four speakers on on four uh, important areas. So, um, and because we have put forward uh, presentations. Um, on, on four uh, different areas. When you ask your question, please be specific um, as to whom you are directing your question and try to keep it tight. We have about uh, 25 minutes before we're going to take our lunch break and then uh, move to our, our keynote speaker uh, at, at the noon hour. So uh, with that, uh, the floor is open for your questions. Um, I see a number of hands going up. I will try to get to as many of you as possible. Marissa, why don't you try to uh, head over here to the right side with uh, Mr. Wolf by the wall, um, and then we'll take the next one. Thank you. Uh, my name is Norman Wolf, and uh, I congratulate the panel. I mean, it's really been an excellent night. I would like to ask questions of each, but I'll confine myself to Joel Witt if I could, because uh, I totally agree with what he said. Uh, I've always thought strategic patience was not the right term. It should have been strategic indifference. Um, <laughs> But uh, Toby made an interesting point for me, and he said that one of the first things he'd recommend to a new president dealing with South Asia is fix the policy structure. And I wonder if you think that there is a problem with the existing policy structure and whether that would be a recommendation you would make in the area of dealing with North Korea. Thank you. All right. And before you take that, Joel, Marissa, why don't we just take one more, and we'll take a couple at a time since we have several right behind you. Yep. And Carlo Trezza from Italy. Also a question to Joy Witt. Um, your presentation is rather pessimistic, but uh, well, the panorama is, is, is not, it's rather bleak. I agree with you. But there's one element of hope 
uh, uh, and it's an evolution. Both uh, Russia and China are becoming concerned by by the DPRK. Uh, and you said that their missile capacity can can even reach uh, China and I guess also Russia. So uh, maybe they're also they are fed up with this situation and um, they can exercise uh, pressure on the DPRK. And also, um, what is wrong with uh, the DPRK suggestion for negotiation, for negotiating uh, a, a, a peace treaty? After all, 60 years have passed uh, from the Korean War, and maybe it is time at least to establish the borders. The most dangerous one is the northern limit line, which is not defined at all. Thank you. Thank you. Joel. Okay. Thank you. Good questions. Um, uh, policy structure. I, Norm is, has this experience, as I do. Um, this is obviously a very difficult issue to deal with. So the question is, can the regular bureaucracy deal with this issue? And the answer is no, it's not possible. So I and, and Norm also have been part of an experience where you had one guy in charge who actually drove it forward, drove to a conclusion, the agreed framework in 1994. I think today that's what you need again. Otherwise, leaving this to the State Department and the other bureaucracies, nothing's ever going to happen. We're just going to have more patience. Um, secondly, on your point, first, yes, every time I give a presentation, people, there's always someone who rightly points out you're being pessimistic. <laughs> uh, yes, you're absolutely right. But I would say maybe it's a psychological defense. I'm being realistic. And I think that's what's important here. Um, uh, yes, we would all like to find elements of hope. But I would suggest that uh, relying on Russia and China and some sort of change in particularly China's approach uh, isn't going to work. I mean, we've been doing that for 20 years. Uh, how many times have I had the discussion with people where they're saying, oh, it looks like China is changing its approach. You know, it's happened over and over and over again. And the, there may be changes, but they're tactical. And you probably follow the newspapers. You saw President Xi just met with the former North Korean foreign minister, who's now a member of the Politburo. A lot of people are interpreting that as China accepting North Korea as a nuclear weapon. So um, I'm, I don't see that as an element. Third, on the North Korean suggestion, let's negotiate a peace treaty. I agree. I don't see anything wrong with that as long as we get our issues on the table. The problem is that's really very difficult for Americans and people in Northeast Asia to visualize because a peace treaty in theory could lead us to a very different Northeast Asia, a very different Korean peninsula, what the impact would be on our alliances in Northeast Asia if there was forward progress. So it's very hard for people to make that leap. But I would argue, as I said in my presentation, think out of the box. The only way we're going to deal with this problem is by addressing core security concerns on both sides. I've been in meetings where people say, ah, oh, the North Koreans, they don't have anything to fear from the United States. Why do they think we're a security threat? Well, you know, I mean, you don't have to meet with North Koreans regularly to see what's wrong with that statement. So that's what has to be done, and it's very hard. Joel, before we maybe move on to some questions on for the other panelists on other issues, if you could just uh, quickly just remind us that I mean, no matter how difficult this is, what are the stakes? And, and, and your institute has done some careful research on future scenarios in terms of what the North Koreans may have in their arsenal 
years down the road. So mean the implications. Well, I just mean so. For instance, by by 2020, by the end of this next president's first term, I mean, how many nuclear weapons might the North Koreans have at their disposal? What might some of their missile capabilities be based upon? Some of the research that that oh, you and your okay. team so have done, just really, it. yeah, really briefly, technical just part. to remind people what's at stake there. Yeah, I, I think as I said earlier, uh, we did three different scenarios, or should, I should say, David Albright did these three scenarios. And the range in weapons was from twenty to a hundred. That doesn't sound like a lot to us in the United States, but it sure sounds like a lot to the South Koreans and the Japanese. And of course, the qualitative improvements are almost as important. It's unclear. Uh, I think, and David thinks, and now the U.S. government thinks, and the South Koreans are admitting that the North Koreans can put a warhead on top of at least a regional range missile. So they've made qualitative improvements, and depending on the pace of nuclear testing, they could make a lot more including the possibility of developing a very simple single stage hydrogen bomb by 2020. So the, the nuclear side of things, that's pretty much what we saw on the missile side. Once again, it's complicated, more complicated than the nuclear side. The big development out there, the elephant sitting in the corner of the room is whether they can build an ICBM. We've seen it. We've seen mock-ups on it, of it in parade. We've seen tests of the rocket engine motors. Uh, you know, what's next? Well, we may see more tests. We may even see a test of the, the weapon itself. Uh, so these are all things that shouldn't be taking people by surprise and are coming down the pike. All right, we've got some other questions here. Um, Marissa, why don't you come here to the front table and take this gentle lady's question. Thanks. Hello, my name is Angela Veach, and my question is for Zia. So um, my understanding is that Pakistan won't participate in FNCT negotiations in this region because of its strategic concerns vis-a-vis My question is a little bit of a technical one. I was hoping you could talk about um, estimates for the size of Pakistan and India's fissile material stockpiles and at current rates of production, how long it would take Pakistan to catch up with India um, under the scenario that that would be the critical juncture at which they could join FMCT negotiations. All right, and why don't we take uh, one more question here in the middle. Gentlemen, can thumb wrestle over your question. Okay, yeah. Pierce. Go Pierce ahead. Corden uh, for Susan. Um, there's a, a, I've probably been in the business maybe too long, but there's something called the United Nations Disarmament Commission, which meets annually. Uh, it's a primary objective uh, of one of two at the moment that is to consider uh, all aspects of nuclear disarmament. By definition, uh, all UN members are there, which means all of the states, both in and out of the NPC. Uh, and uh, the United States participates, but uh, I don't say it, would say it gives a very good attention to that. What are the prospects that the UNDC could uh, sort of become a, a more uh, central point of dealing uh, involving all of the uh, possessing states and, and all of the other states? And perhaps uh, uh, the OEW morph over in, into that forum, which uh, Lewis is ready to continue working definitely. Uh, be picking that up, uh, bearing in mind that uh, the Thank you. So yeah, why don't you take that first question, please? Yeah, um, so thank you for that. Um, so our International Panel on Fissile Materials does these estimates on a, on a regular basis, and you can find the most recent ones in our um, most recent Global Fissile Material Report. But I think the interesting thing is actually not the current balance of uh, materials. The 
question is the presumption behind your question and the claim that Pakistan makes that it is delaying and blocking um, the beginning of, of talks at the conference on disarmament on a fissile material cutoff treaty because of India's larger fissile material stockpile. It's true Pakistan has made an enormous investment in building up the production capacity for, especially for plutonium, for weapons plutonium, um, in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, I mean, as of 2000, 2001, it had one plutonium production reactor. Now it has four that are operating. But I think the thing you have to understand is that there is actually not that much difference in the stockpiles of material produced for weapons purposes between the two countries. What Pakistan points to is India's large stockpile of unsafeguarded plutonium that is from Indian nuclear power reactors, which India says was made and will be used for fuel for its breeder reactor program. In other words, Pakistan is putting on the table an Indian stockpile which is outside safeguards, but which India claims is not for weapons purposes. Um, there is a concern behind this, and that is that India's fast breeder reactor, it will use plutonium as fuel, but it can produce weapon-grade plutonium as a byproduct of its operation. So it will be a laundry. It will take reactor-grade plutonium as fuel and produce weapon-grade plutonium as a byproduct. So Pakistan says, well, look, that's what we're afraid of down the road. And it's a legitimate fear because that breeder reactor, which is already six years late, if it operates at any reasonable rate, uh, which is uh, uncertain because most people who've tried breeder reactors have realized they're actually very hard and very unsafe and um, have lots of problems and can't get them to operate well. But that breeder reactor, if it works, could increase India's weapon plutonium production rate almost tenfold. So um, the sad part, of course, is that the United States has had 15 years to deal with the Pakistani concerns and the Indian breeder reactor program and has refused to take either aspect seriously because of other interests. Since 9-11, the United States has been more interested in chasing Al-Qaeda and killing Taliban than dealing with Pakistan building up its weapons program. And it has been more interested in recruiting India to its side in an emerging Cold War with China and having access to the Indian market and all these other things. So we won't talk too much about what India is doing with its nuclear program, as Toby mentioned earlier on. So. The real reason I think that Pakistan is blocking is the fact that it can. Right? And it's using that time to build up its arsenal to whatever size it thinks is appropriate, really regardless of how big India's stockpile is or isn't. And it's largely, you know, our fault. All right. Why don't we go to the question about the UNDC, the UN Disarmament Commission? Um, Pierce, I don't really know. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I mean, I see Randy Rydell. He might know better, but I, I'm not aware of the UNDC producing anything in recent memory. Um, <laughs> and I, and I, I remember years ago, probably when I was at the Pentagon, you know, where it was more, uh, you know, doing stuff. But I, I'm not aware that it's uh, it's being used by any state. Uh, to do anything meaningful. Now, the the other thing with the UNDC, I just off my personal opinion, if it's under UN rules, you know, where you can vote things in or out, well, if it's consensus, I, I just don't know. And I, I my impression of it is that it has not been particularly active or, you know, in the front lines or even in the middle lines, maybe not even the rear lines, for a long time. So it would require a, a retooling. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I, I just don't know the answer to that question. Let me just, uh, before we go to the next question, let me just ask a follow-up of, uh, of Toby and, and Zia on the fiscal material cutoff treaty issue. At, at the end of your response, Zia, you said that Pakistan was blocking uh, the start of negotiations at the Conference on Disarmament because they could, because the Conference on Disarmament operates according to the consensus rules, so one country can, can block. Um, just this January, as we reported in Arms Control today, the U.S. put forward an informal proposal that would meet one of Pakistan's concerns, which is to discuss the stockpiles as part of a negotiation. Pakistan is still opposed. Then when Prime Minister Trudeau came to Washington, met with President Obama, there was a very small uh, little notice line 
that they issued in their statement uh, that perhaps other approaches to pursue a fiscal material cutoff treaty other than the Conference on Disarmament might need to be explored. So, I mean, quickly, if, if Toby and Zia, you could just address this question. I mean, is there another option for the U.S. president, the next U.S. president, to get negotiations going, uh, maybe outside of the Conference on Disarmament, where consensus-based rules are not necessarily in effect? Can we work with the other uh, nuclear armed states with fissile stockpiles? Is there another way, yes or, or no? Um, it's possible to go outside the Conference on Disarmament, I and mean, there's no reason why not. The issue, of course, is that just in the way that, that Susan Burke mentioned, the nuclear weapon states, when they want to protect their interests, insist on a consensus-based approach. Like when we talk about nuclear disarmament, the other nuclear weapon states that we would want to be involved in a fissile material cutoff treaty, the Russians, the Chinese, the others may say, well, look, the U.S. may be fine because it has all these allies but who will vote for whatever it wants, but we don't, so therefore we want consensus in any process. And so you could get a process, but it may well be that other weapon states to protect their own interests in a negotiation will want consensus also. So whether that helps the process go that much further forward, much faster is unclear, given the differences that they have in their negotiating positions. But um, I think the real issue is not the need or not to go outside the fissile material cutoff treaty negotiation in Geneva. We could have them in Geneva. The question you have to ask is whether a country as dependent on the international system as Pakistan right. is able to withstand the entire international community. The only reason it does it is because no one cares enough to call them on it. And they're getting away with it precisely for that reason. Everybody else has more important interests with Pakistan than fissile material. The day that begins to change, the Pakistani position will begin to change. And you have to remember, we've been here once before. In 1998, at the time of the nuclear test, the Pakistani said, sure, we have already have enough fissile material. We can have negotiations on a fissile material cutoff treaty. That was 1998 because they saw that the world was really concerned about the nuclear tests and wanted something done. It's going to be that kind of determination that will force Pakistan to say, okay, we'll let the process go forward. Doesn't mean they will agree to a treaty when it's done, until they've got enough fissile material to suit themselves. But this really is a question of how badly the international community wants this treaty. I wouldn't add much to that other than to reinforce what Zia had suggested, which is that within the P5, certainly there is a range of views on the desirability of an FMCT, let alone an FMT. Uh, and so the risk in, in shifting outside uh, the CD is that we, we might find that the, the five quickly becomes a, a much smaller number uh, of states that are actually interested in looking at it. All right. Um, I think I see a couple more hands. Uh, there's one way in the back. I want to respect the people in the rear of the room. So if you could uh, get to her, yes. And then we'll take one more up front, and then we're about at our lunch break. Shala Sadiqi from Voice of America Persian TV Network. Uh, I know it's this event is focused on Asia, Northeast Asia. Uh, perhaps I can ask the panel about uh, with regards to China's interest in investment in Pakistan and recent uh, trade uh, cooperation between India and Iran. Do you see any uh, possibility of nuclear uh, cooperation between India and Iran? And how can the future United States president uh, strike a balance with regards to China's presence there and India as an um, ally of the United States and uh, Pakistan and India as old foes, perhaps Mr. Witt, Mr. Dalton. All right, let's take one more question and as we consider that one uh, right here, please. <laughs> Thank you. Benjamin Tour, retired Foreign Service officer. Israel seems to be opening up a little bit on its nuclear weapons program. How do you see this evolution, if indeed it exists, uh, moving ahead in the next uh, few years? Uh, there was mention, I think Susan Burke mentioned, uh, uh, nuclear weapons free zones. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to ask Toby to try the first question that was asked, and then we'll, we'll turn to the second. 
Uh, so as I understand it, the question was, you know, how should China uh, and India and Iran, um, you know, how, how does that all look uh, in Asia, uh, particularly as, as nuclear trade is concerned going forward, uh, and whether there's potential for some stabilizing role there. Uh, I, I think, you know, the, the, the questions about Iran, as Daryl highlighted, have focused much more on the closing down of the, the weapons infrastructure. Um, what we see still is interest in nuclear energy there, uh, and Russia has, has been the primary recipient of that interest, and I would imagine would continue to be the primary recipient of that interest. Um, India uh, has been constructing reactors on its own territory, but largely has not participated much in international nuclear trade, uh, and uh, I think is still quite a ways away from, from being able to, to do that. Um, but the big question mark now is the extent to which China is becoming more of a supplier uh, and what that means in terms of the international market and the rules and practices associated with that. Uh, until now, it's primarily been building uh, reactors in Pakistan, but has participated uh, in um, a number of bids to build reactors uh, outside uh, of Pakistan. Uh, and so it's conceivable that in the future it could play a much larger role uh, in the nuclear power programs of other states. Um, that kind of then leads to the questions about whether China has the same um, priorities uh, in terms of safety, security, um, uh, responsible uh, practices. Um, I think w that's not something we should take for granted, um, but there's not a lot of evidence at this point to suggest that they don't. Uh, and so that strikes me as an area uh, for uh, important conversations and cooperation going forward. Susan, do you want to try to take the question about uh, Israel's uh, interest or its role in uh, reducing nuclear risk, especially through the WMD free zone in the Middle East? And well, I'll just, you know, I, I haven't been involved in the Middle East discussions. Israel's not a party to the NPT. Uh, the Middle East issue, as I mentioned, has been uh, a, a substantive issue at NPT review conferences ever since 95, although even prior to that, it was always some dust up about the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, whatever that would be, would keep people uh, in the conference room until three in the morning. Um, I, I'm not going to comment on whether or not they're opening up or not, but the, there were valiant efforts made after the 2010 conference to try to uh, convene a, a conference of regional states to discuss um, uh, establishing a weapons of mass destruction free zone. That's the proposal, not just nuclear, but all weapons of mass destruction. And uh, in the end, at least from reporting, the Israelis were participating in these meetings, but um, there was not, the, but the, it was the Arabs that were, were um, not reaching out to Israel and ended up not participating. Iran wasn't participating in any of the meetings. So uh, the, the conditions just don't seem right there, but I, it, it's not Israel that is the problem, as best I can tell, in terms of at least getting together with regional partners to scope out the, the parameters of a conference. Um, I think uh, it's safe to say that the, the obstacle has been the larger group of states, and I, I won't go any further than that. And I would just add that, uh, you know, as we look at the Middle East region, which we've not covered uh, too much in this session, um, uh, you know, we, the Arms Control Association, have been talking about and we will continue to uh, discuss ways in which we can build upon the JCPOA, the Iran deal, uh, to head off possible future Iranian interests in nuclear weapons beyond the terms of the, that agreement, um, uh, as well as looking for ways in which other countries in the region, including Israel, can uh, join in some of the multilateral measures like the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which Israel has signed but not ratified. You know, there are ways in which other countries can uh, help reduce nuclear risks and create the conditions towards a WMD free zone in the region, perhaps beginning with a nuclear weapon test free zone in the region. So that'll be a, a subject of, uh, of focus for the Arms Control Association at, uh, at future events. But uh, we are out of scheduled time. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists. <laughs>